the only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The pulpit by large is given out. Nothing but worldly ways to be a Christian. And it's showing. God's people are showing that. It's giving out what I call a, a fence straddling, easy Christianity. You go ahead and you live like hell on Monday and Tuesday, jump into the house of God if you do. Say amen five times and head back out. Live like hell the rest of the week and then come into the house of God and wonder why there's no liberty there. That's where we're at now. They tell you their opinions of what they, they believe that you need to receive the favor of God. That's all they're talking about. This is what you got to do to get the favor of God. Well, may I remind you tonight that if you're saved, God already has given you His favor. Amen. He died on the cross of Calvary so that you and I could be saved and have eternal life. He sent the Holy Spirit to point out to us that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And then after He does that, God makes sure that the Holy Ghost comes to indwell us to teach us that Word and to keep us out of trouble. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, He'll warn you when you're fixing to get in trouble. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I probably told you this a hundred times since I've been here, but there's one sure way to know if you're supposed to not do something. If you've got to think on it a lot, don't do it. That's a clear sign the Holy Spirit said, get away from that thing, boy, before you get in trouble. Also, he, He's in heaven right now. When He came, He died. He walked on this earth 40 days, a number of testing to prove what He said He would do. He arose and sat down at the right hand of God. And by the way, He's making intercession for you and me right at this very moment. You know, something else, He went to prepare a place for us. I touched that on that some at the graveyard this morning. And I, I don't know about y'all, I get excited about things when I go to thinking too much on them. And I, and I got to thinking, I said, if God, who was here before anything and made everything by simply his thought and his saying, let there be. Could you imagine what our place looks like in heaven when he prepared it? That's the grand architect that did that. And, and let me say one more thing. A lot of people say that's just a, just a room, but it's a big old room with a mansion in it because that's what the Word of God says. But if it had nothing, as long as I was there with Jesus and reunited with my family, and God's people, that'd be heaven enough for me. You see, He's preparing a place for us and He's coming again. I'm looking forward to that. I said, I said I, I, I'd be glad to go right now we could get there. So I'm looking forward to that. May I ask a question tonight? How much more favor do you and I need from God? He loves us. He died for us when we get a sinner. He makes intercession for us when we mess up. He has the Holy Spirit pray for us when we're so full of grief and so full of trouble that we don't know what to say. He's prepared a place for us. He's coming personally to get you and me. And I can't believe anything else could be asked of God more than that. Amen. Now, we don't need worldly riches, right? Do you agree with that? Now, I'm, I'm not rich, but you can see I'm not under faith. We don't need riches. When they tell us that if we'll do this, we'll get the favor of God and we can get all these good things from God, all this money. May I ask you something? If we're living in the last days and we really believe Jesus is coming very soon, what will we do with it? Once He calls us up out here, it's totally useless, worthless. I mean, they don't even take it nowhere in heaven. Amen? No need for it. And, and we don't need more worldly wisdom, do we? Well, worldly wisdom uh, in this day and time has made most of the folks in the world fools because they cannot believe in Christ. I don't want worldly wisdom. I was enough of a fool before I met Christ. When we get to heaven, we're going to be the bride of Christ. So we don't need popularity. Amen. How much better could it be than to be the bride of the King of Kings and the Lord? Why would we need such a thing? I, I'm satisfied with that. And, and also, folks, we need to understand that soon the church is going to leave this world behind. And we only have a short time. I believe a very short. I've told you short probably, what, maybe 20 years ago. I don't know. 
but it's, it's shorter than it was then. We're just about there. A short time before we are with the Lord and knowing all of these things, I, I, I have a question. Does the church of the living God, what does it need in these times? What does it need? I thought on that God spoke to me. You know what we need? We need just an old-fashioned dose of old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled faith. Why don't we, the church, have the power we used to have? We serve the right God, right? We believe the right things. We have the right manual. So why don't we see the power of God move like it used to? Why does it move in third world countries? That boggles my mind. I've been to churches where there might be three or 400 people and you couldn't get an amen in there if you pulled your gun with the sheet and it's the ones that wouldn't say it. And you go to a third world country where they are doing that and, and some of them starving and some of them walking to church for miles, not having anything to drink while they get there. And when they get there, the Holy Ghost rises up in the middle of it and you can't hardly preach because he's got people shouting so much in the house of God. Why is that? Doesn't that make you wonder? God's not lost power. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. No change on God's part. What we've done is we got away from true, old-fashioned, ground-shaking faith of God, like the old preachers used to preach. My, my uncle was a preacher, told me my grandfather, who was a preacher, who, by the way, couldn't read, but would sit kids on his lap. They'd read the Word of God to him. He'd memorize it. And my uncle said he preached the heart. It scared him to death. Holy Spirit moved. Just a farmer. Had to go to work too, too early to be able to learn to read, but God made a way because he accepted the call on his life. People talk about their faith today. You talk to people, say, do you have faith? I have faith. I, I've not run across many that said, no, I don't have any faith. Brother Sean, they tell me every time, I've got faith. But I'm afraid what it is, it's verbal faith. You see, verbal faith just isn't enough. It won't make a change in your life. It won't make a change in the church's life. It won't make a change in the world's life. You can say a lot of things verbally. I can tell you I'm a, a chicken and I'm going to lay an egg tomorrow, but that's a lie. Nothing to back it up tomorrow. And I'm afraid that's the way we're getting as the church of God. It's, it's all tall and no wall. Amen. And I think, again, a lot of it's that they have mental faith. They think in their mind that there is such a thing as faith. They think in their mind that there is power with faith. And yet all they do is think in their mind and move their lips and they don't try faith. That's something. What good is faith if it's not trying? Isn't faith like a muscle? I don't know how many of you men used to lift weights. I did. I, I know it doesn't look like it now. No, I used to be pretty good size. And I found out that as long as you lifted and exercised the muscle, it did work. Grew, got bigger, got stronger, could be tested more and more. And that's the same way with faith. Faith has to be tested. Faith has to be used. Faith has to be put to a, a test or, you know what faith will do just like the muscle will. It'll get weaker and weaker weaker until it's something called dead faith. Faith is no good if it's dead. As a matter of fact, I believe, I believe something's worse. There's nothing worse than dead faith. Because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. And dead faith, when you talk to lost people about having faith in Jesus Christ, it will not touch their hearts. And dead faith will not encourage a child of God when they watch you say you believe in faith and it's what we need. And yet you never put it to the test. Huh? Folks, faith without being used is dead eventually. And I'm afraid that's where we're headed, Pastor, with a lot of the churches now. Faith is, that is only talked about and faith that's only thought about has no course but to die eventually if it's not tested. Now, true old-fashioned life-changing faith does one thing for sure. It obeys the Word of God. We have a perfect book here. We'll know what God thinks about something. We'll know what God doesn't want you to do. Want to know what God requires of you to walk close to Him. It's right here. It's right here. But the problem is, 
we don't obey the Word of God. You know what we do? We hear it, we read it, but we don't obey it. How can you be blessed? How can you have fellowship with God? How can you have power in the church? How can you reach a lost person? How can you encourage anybody? How can you bind up the devil? What can you do if you don't obey the Word of God? You say, Brother Tom, this ain't real happy preaching. Well, it will be if you'll, you'll take what God's saying and start lining up with it. True old-fashioned faith causes us to find God's will. You can ask half the church and you stay in which you live what God's will is for them, I don't know. Is God hiding it? No. You know how you find the will of God? You decide in your heart you want it. And then you simply ask Him what His will is. Well, Pastor, I, I was looking for the will of God in my life. You know what He did? He called me to preach. We argued about that. I said, you sure that's the will? Then He, he got me to a place called Hay I had never seen before and to be quite honest, never heard before. God if you want to have a big load of old-fashioned faith, you've got to obey God's Word. And you've got to want God's will. And then you've got to ask Him for the strength to do His will. It's not always easy to serve God. I wouldn't take nothing for what God's put in my life through the years to serve Him. But I will tell you, there's times I thought, I, I hope I made the right decision on this. And I can say now, I'm getting older, I certainly did. True old-fashioned faith causes us to get closer to God. Do you know that? That old-fashioned faith. We can't get close to God now because we're not trying to get close to God. Doesn't the Bible say if you'll draw nigh to God, that He'll draw nigh to you? And if you're not feeling close to God, and you feel like He's afar off and you can't talk to Him, is it God that's refusing to talk? No. It has to be right here. He wants to talk to me more than I want to talk to him. There's not many people like to talk to me, but God does. But he can't do it unless I have old-fashioned faith to obey the Word of God, to find the will of God, to get into the will of God and do the will of God. And that automatically draws us closer to God. Amen. For old-fashioned faith, when we get closer to God, draws us further from the world. You say, Brother Tom, the world's got to pull on me. Well, just maybe, maybe if we draw closer to God and get filled with that old-fashioned faith of our forefathers, just maybe it draws closer to Him and puts the world farther from us. That's the trouble with churches nowadays. They want a little bit of the world and a little bit of God. And that's exactly what they're getting. Very little of God and a whole lot of the world. Amen. When we get close to drive, it, God, it drives us further from the world. The farther we get from the world, guess what? The easier it is to resist the devil. Isn't that amazing? I've heard people say the devil made me do that. I believe Flip Wilson used to go, woo, and let out a crazy thing so the devil made me do it and everybody laughed. The devil can't make you do anything. You can resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. So if the devil made you do something, what was the problem? We weren't full of enough old-fashioned Bible-believing faith and we weren't reading the Word of God and we weren't hearing the Word of God and we weren't doing the Word of God and we weren't being filled with the Spirit and we're out of the will of God. It's sure hard to resist Him when you're full of the world, amen? The further we get from the world, it is resist the devil. Old-fashioned faith empowers us to reach the lost. Why are we seeing more people saved? I believe Jesus said the fields are white for harvest, right? This world's searching for something to hang on to. The problem is the world's giving it a whole lot to hang on to, and God's people have set by and not showed them what they should grab on to, the hand of God. God stands before a world and says, come. For whosoever is, let him come. He said, if you'll come to me, I'll know wise. Cast you out. We've got the truth. We've got the good news. We've got the fields full of harvest, and yet the harvest isn't coming in because we don't have old-fashioned faith and walk close to God. So Brother Tom, I don't like his hide bust and preaching, neither do I, but it's necessary sometimes. Surely if I have a problem with these things, y'all do, right? If some of you don't, will you please meet with me sometime this week and tell me how to get to that point? Please help me. Old-fashioned faith empowers us to reach the lost. It also empowers us to have revival. Everybody talks about revival. 
I've been called all over the place to preach revival. I've been, I've been down to Alabama where we we're supposed to be preaching revival. We had some good messages and pretty good fellowship, I guess. But there wasn't no real revival. So how you know, because I checked up on them after I left. Guess what? The change didn't last. Revival that's true, that's true and full of God's movement, His Holy Spirit, will grab a hold of the church folk and it'll empower. And the church folk will get empowered and they'll tell the lost. And the lost will hear the truth and they'll come to God. And if that don't bring revival, I don't know what will. So we want revival. Well, we need to go back to the old past and the old ways. Heard people say, I, I don't like that old fashioned preaching. I said, you don't like it because you won't sit long enough to hear it and let it get into you and help you. I've had people stand up that's, that's got educations and there's nothing wrong with educations. They'll reach from here up to halfway to heaven. And I can't figure out for the life of me what the preachers are preaching on or what they're aiming at. It's like they're not aiming at anything. Scatter gun, blaster, and hope somebody gets it. God's got specific things He wants you and me as preachers to aim at at specific times. And if we don't do it, then we're sinning and we're shortening the Word of God. You know what else the, a good dose of old-fashioned, ground-shaking, devil-disturbing faith in Jesus Christ will do? It'll stop us from complaining and moaning and groaning. I tell you how I know whether somebody is full of faith. They won't say much about what they're going through. They'll say, pray for me, preacher. And I'm not telling you you shouldn't say anything, but you know what? There's, there's people that that's all they do is complain. You run into a And the trouble is, they're good at it, and they lock you up for about an hour. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, I'd like to cut a trail somewhere. I don't think I can help you. And only God can help you. Amen? That sounds mean. I'm not mean. I, I'm looking at you, and I'm seeing a lot of heads going north to south. It'll cause us not to complain when trials and tribulations and tests come our way. We act like we're surprised. Jesus promises, didn't he? In this world, you'll have what? He didn't say you'd have a picnic and a, a steak on the grill and a good old time while he goes there. We're in a fight. We're not dancing with the world or dancing with the devil. We're in warfare. And how can you win warfare if you don't use the weapons that God gives you to fight with? Amen. You see, you've got to love God more than you love yourself. You've got to love God more than you love your wife. You gotta love God more than you love anything on this earth. And you're gonna to have to decide that whether God inconvenience you, whatever He calls you to do, that you're gonna do it because you love God that much. Now I'm not trying to be mean dust preachers. Some of us are old and we've we've went around a lot of places for the Lord. But somebody told me one time that like seventy percent of the preachers in the world are in America. How come there's people North Dakota, South Dakota, California, everywhere we say, they come in here saying there's no church to where they can worship God in spirit and in truth. How come there's people on the foreign field that are not having the gospel preached to them, that are not able to get to where they can hear the truth and be set free? It tells me maybe, just maybe, some of us ain't listening to God. Or we listen to Him and we cut a trail on Him. Wait a minute, man, Lord, I, I don't know whether I really meant that or not. Well, God meant it to be called you. Since his, his callings are without what? Repentance. I believe there's a lot of preachers, and, and I'm, I, I don't mean to be mean that ain't doing what God called them to do or going where God called them to go. Now, you're living in the last days. You believe that? I believe we've got a short time to serve God. And I know that the only way we'll get the power of God in our lives to serve Him and to finish. God didn't call quitters. God didn't call cowards. God called men and women that He trusted with the Word of God to finish the work that He began when He was on His earth. Do you read anywhere where you find plan B? We're it. God's people loving God more than anything else, obeying His Word, walking in His Word, in His will, loving Him, and doing what He called us to do. Want revival? That'll do it. Want to see people saved? That'll do it. Want to see your families changed? That'll do it. 
Somebody in the family's got to make a move. Because that's what we all do. It's real easy to sit on the couch and watch the TV. It? That sounds negative, doesn't it? But it's not. God wants to bless you. God wants us to be real for once. And God wants us to finish this thing and stay on the course and vary nowhere to dig our feet in. No matter what the world says is right, if God's word don't say it, it's wrong. And we're not going to have it. You're going to have to love other people more than yourself because it's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you prayer. And it's going to cost you sacrifice to do what God calls you to do. If you finish what God calls you to do in the will of God, with the power of God on you, loving him more than anything else, guess what? We hear John good and faithful. That's, that's all I want to hear. All I ever want to be once I was called just old-fashioned preacher that pleased God and one day instead of standing with my head hung at the beam of the seat of Christ I said, well Tom, you did this as good as I I reckon you could with what I gave you to work with. And I asked you something. How's your faith? How strong is it? How's it growing? What difference is it making in people's life that come into your life? How much do you pray for your pastor? for the word of God to go forth. How's your faith? Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.